hell? Is it real? Is it a place far under the ground somewhere? And is it burning now? That's our fiery topic on His Voice Today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. Welcome to the Hot Topic of Hell, Part 1. It was a Sunday night, November 23rd, 1998. Southern California realtor Bill Weiss and his wife had been to prayer meeting, and then they went to bed somewhere around 11 o'clock. Uh, at 3 a.m., Bill had a frightening experience. Uh, in, in his words, as he describes it, apparently he was taken in a, some kind of a vision. He was picked up out of his body, and he was taken to a place called hell, and he saw uh, just incredibly scary things. His vision lasted for 23 minutes, and at exactly 3.23, he came out of his vision and he just was screaming in the living room, and his wife woke up, looked at the clock, saw that it was exactly 3.23, went into the living room and, and found him uh, screaming and crying. And when he regained his sanity, he told her the story of what had happened and how he had been to hell for 23 minutes and that Jesus had shown him uh, just a whole host of frightening things. It wasn't long until Bill was invited to give his testimony in different churches. Then he went on the radio, he went on television. Eventually in the year 2006, his book was published and it went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list describing his experience of 23 minutes in hell. The back cover of the book has this to say, Quote, Bill Wee saw the searing flames of hell. He felt total isolation and experienced the putrid and rotting stench, deafening screams of agonizing, uh, terrorizing demons, and finally, the strong hand of God lifting out of the pit. And then he heard a voice, apparently from Jesus, that said, tell them that I am coming very, very soon. There's a whole lot of people that have read this book. They've watched his testimony on YouTube and they've heard him in person. And, you know, as you think about that and you just try to make sense of his experience, uh, we really have one of two options, at least major options. And one is that God gave him this vision, this out of body experience, to teach us the truth about hell and to direct us to the Bible. The other option, which a lot of people don't often think about, is that uh, this supernatural experience could have come from the dark side. Uh, it could have come from Satan to lead us astray from Bible truth. So we are here in His voice today to examine what God's voice really says from the Bible. What is the truth about this subject? Uh, by His grace, we are going to find out. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to follow along with me and let's take a close look at many different Bible verses and try to make sense out of what the Bible actually says about hell. The first text we're going to look at is in Matthew chapter 23. A correction, that's Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 gives a series of stories and parables that Jesus Christ told when he was here on earth. And one of these stories described and explained in verses 37 to 43 is a story where Jesus told uh, about a farmer and about a field and about a harvest. His disciples asked him to explain this parable, and so Jesus did. And we find his explanation going on in verses 37 to verse 43. And in verse 37, Jesus answered and told his disciples. He said, he who sows the good seed is the son of man, representing himself. He is the farmer. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, and the weeds are the children of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angel, the angels. Verse 40, as therefore the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them which commit sin. 
and he will cast them into a furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun. In the kingdom of their father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I certainly want to hear what Jesus has to say, and I believe you do too. And as we look at these words carefully, there's a number of uh, points I want to make. And it seems to me, and hopefully it uh, impresses you, that as you read these words, it's very clear that Jesus Christ himself certainly believed in a real fire. He talked about a furnace of fire. He talked about people eventually uh, being thrown into this fire. He talked about people wailing and gnashing their teeth, which represents uh, some people are crying, some people are angry. Gnashing the teeth has to do with anger. And so Jesus definitely portrayed this as something very, very real. And, and I want you to know that I believe this. I believe that the Bible is true and that what Jesus says is real. But now notice something. There's something significant in Jesus' explanation of the parable. In verse 39, he said that the enemy who sowed the bad seeds is the devil and the harvest is the end of the world. Notice, the end of the world. The reapers are the angels, and as therefore the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So, putting these pieces together, we know that there is a real fire. Jesus believed in a fire. I believe in a fire. I hope you believe that this is what the Bible says, and hopefully you believe that it's true. Uh, but then the second point is, according to Jesus Christ, this furnace of fire is something that will happen. It's not happening right now, but he said it will happen at the end of this world. Let me read it again. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So Jesus taught there's a real fire, but he, he didn't put it uh, as something that is happening right now. He put it far down to the very end of time, the end of the world. Now, let's see if there's some other verses that teach the same thing. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 is a chapter where Peter describes the end of the world, the day of the Lord that will come like a thief in the night. Uh, he describes this in verse 10. Peter wrote that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So in the day of the Lord, which obviously hasn't happened yet, there's going to be uh, fire, there's going to be a great noise, there's going to be fervent heat, and it's going to burn up the earth and its wicked works, or at least the wicked works that people are doing in the earth. Now, if you go back to verse 7, Peter basically says the same thing. He says, the heavens and the earth, and the word heavens doesn't mean the place where God is. It refers to the atmospheric heavens where the, where the birds fly, the birds flying in the midst of the heavens the Bible talks about. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, referring to the word of God, are kept in store and they are reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So uh, Peter's basically saying what Jesus said, that there, there is going to be a real fire, it's really going to burn, but Peter puts it, not right now, he puts it at the day of the Lord, at the end of the world. And Peter is very clear that the ungodly, referring to the wicked, uh, they are reserved for that day reserved, and the heavens and the earth are reserved for fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So ungodly men are going into the fire, but it's going to be, not right now, but it's going to be at the end of the world. If you go back to chapter 2 and look at verse 9, Peter says something similar. He says that, the, he wrote that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So this verse says that God knows how to protect his people. He knows how to preserve and, uh, and keep them from temptations, but he will reserve or preserve the unjust, it says, until the day of judgment to be punished. So when do the unjust get punished according to 2 Peter 2 verse 9? 
He said, Peter wrote, and this is what the Bible says, that the unjust will be punished on the day of judgment, which obviously has not yet taken place for people around the world. So when you put these verses together, we have these significant points. Let me read these to you from my own notes here. Very clear, right from the Bible. Point number one is there is, there is going to be a real fire. Jesus taught that. Peter taught that, and there's a lot of other verses that teach this, and we'll look at many of those other verses. According to Jesus and according to Peter, point number two is that this fire occurs at the end of the world. Point number three, it is synonymous with occurring on the day of judgment. Point four is the fire will burn the atmospheric heavens and the earth that we are now walking on top of. And then point number five is that is when the lost or the unjust or the wicked will finally get their punishment. Now, that's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 13, and that's what Peter taught in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, what we've just read is obviously quite a bit different from the common view of hell. Uh, when most people think of hell, they think of uh, the dream or the vision or whatever it was that Bill Weiss had and that other people have had. Uh, apparently, they've seen fire, this fiery place, and most people think of it as somewhere way down, 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 who knows how many miles down underneath the ground, uh, way down possibly in the heart of the earth. And they see it as a fiery place where a lost soul will go after he dies. And many times people imagine or they believe uh, that the devil will be down there, possibly with a pitchfork or some kind of, instruments of uh, instrument of torture, and his demons are down there, and people are screaming and howling, and there's just all kinds of uh, awful things, like, just like Bill described in his dream or in his vision. Let me read it again. Uh, he saw the searing flames of hell. He experienced the putrid and the rotting stench the deafening screams of agony, terrorizing demons, and finally the strong hand of God lifting him out of the pit. This is the common view of hell. This is what Bill saw. And again, did God show this to him? Uh, or was it a supernatural experience that came from the dark side to lead people astray? The only way we're going to find out the answer to that question is by looking closely at the Bible. Now, let me share with you a very shocking fact, and it, it's the truth. You can check it out, and I encourage you to check everything that I say out from, from God's book. There is only one place in the entire Bible that seems to teach the idea that hell is under the ground, far below us, and it's a place where a lost soul leaves his body at the point of death and goes under the ground and begins uh, suffering and writhing in the flames. There's only one place that teaches that, and that is the story of the rich man and Lazarus in the book of Luke, chapter 16, which we are going to examine closely in part two of this little mini-series, The Hot Topic of Hell. But before we do, I want to just uh, impress you with a very important fact, an amazing fact, and that is that there is no other verse, not one, in the entire New Testament or in the entire Bible that, uh, that seems to teach that concept that hell is a place under the ground where a lost soul goes at the point of death and, and is burning. If you read the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, you won't find that particular doctrine anywhere. You won't find it in Mark you won't find it in the book of John. When you read the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church and what they preached, what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and what uh, Paul eventually preached after he was converted from Saul to Paul, you, you can read his sermons, Peter's sermons, Paul's sermons, and you won't ever find them teaching anything like this in the entire book of Acts. Uh, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, the majority of the New Testament books he wrote. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossi Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. He wrote a lot of books, 
And yet, amazingly, you will not find anywhere in any of the writings of Paul, which includes the book of Romans, uh, all of his books, this concept that hell is a place under the ground where lost souls go at the point of death. It's just not there. James wrote his little book close to the book of Revelation. It's not in the book of James. Peter wrote 1st and 2nd Peter, completely absent from Peter's teaching. Uh, the book of Jude, which is the little book right before the book of Revelation, talks about judgment, talks about uh, God executing judgment upon the wicked when Jesus Christ comes, but the concept of hell under the ground burning, it's just not there. And when you read the book of Revelation, it's not there either. Uh, like I said, it's, it's nowhere. It's nowhere in the Old Testament, it's nowhere in the New Testament, except one place, which is the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which we will look at in part two. The truth is that there are two primary Greek words that are translated hell in our English Bibles, and the words are Gehenna, and the other word is Hades. Now, I'd like to show you a text where Gehenna is used, which is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. Jesus definitely believed in a fire, but notice what he said and what he didn't say. Matthew chapter, chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, Jesus warned about sexual sin, and he said, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. Now, the Greek word there for hell is Gehenna, and it's obvious when you look at this verse and look at the way Gehenna is used in other verses that Gehenna definitely refers to a real uh, place of fire. In verse 30, Jesus basically said the same thing. If your right hand offends you, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. Now, I don't believe Jesus is really recommending that we actually take a knife and cut off our hands or take out our eyes, but he's the context from verse 27 and 28 is that Jesus is talking about sexual sin, and he's talking about uh, committing adultery and not just the physical act, but, but dwelling upon these things in your mind and you know, seeing either a woman or a man that you really want to be with and uh, basically creating a bed in your heart and doing this, uh, committing adultery inside of you. And Jesus said, if your eye is leading you into sin, he said, it's really better to take your eye out than to go into hell. It's really better to cut your hand off if your hand is leading you into sin. And I think what Jesus is, is saying is that whatever part of us uh, is, is leading us into sexual immorality or any kind of immorality, we really need to make a strong decision to cut out that practice from our lives. That's what Jesus is really saying. But he uses the word Gehenna here, and he uses... Uh, he talks about hell where people will go, and he says that your whole body will eventually go there. He doesn't say your soul is going to leave your body and go there. He says your whole body is going to eventually end up in hell. And the word, again, the Greek word is Gehenna, which basically means a place of burning, a place of fire. So again, I believe it's real. I believe it's coming. And I believe that Jesus' warning needs to be taken seriously. But in these verses, Jesus does not say that you're going to go to hell when you die. He just says that your whole body will go there if you continue to practice sin. But he doesn't say when it will happen in this verse. Now, there's another verse, there's, and there's actually a lot of verses where Jesus talks about the consequences and going into the fire, but in these verses, he doesn't say exactly when. Now, we did read that in Matthew uh, chapter 13, Jesus said that the fire would take place at the end of the world. And we've read in 2 Peter the same thing. So, now let's look at the word Hades, and let's see what it means. Hades is used a number of times in the New Testament, and let's take a look at one of them, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you do your homework and look, at, look up the word Hades in a reputable Bible dictionary, at least one that knows what it's talking about, uh, you'll discover that Hades really should be correctly translated uh, not a place of burning. It's not under, under the ground somewhere where, where souls are being tormented by demons with pitchforks. 
It is actually a word that applies to simply the grave itself. We know this for sure by looking at how the word is used in, in its context in a number of passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 describes the great day when Jesus returns, his second coming. Verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul wrote. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Uh, sleep referring to death, but we will all be transformed if we're true believers. Verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, which and the last trumpet is at the end of the world, for the trumpet will sound, it'll be very loud, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal, which is what we are now, we're mortal beings, shall have put on immortality on resurrection day when Jesus comes, Paul wrote, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then in verse 55, he describes the words that come out of the mouths of the saints on resurrection morning when they come out of the grave. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Now, I don't know if you can see this through the camera lens, but in my Bible, I've, I've circled the word grave here, and there's a little footnote that takes you to a marginal reference on the side, and the word there is hell. And the Greek word is Hades. And so what Paul is basically saying is that the saints on resurrection morning come out of the grave, which is Hades, which is also translated hell, and they come out and they are shouting and praising God because death has no longer any power over them. Now think about it. Uh, here we have Paul describing the saints coming out of Hades and shouting victory over death in the grave. And obviously, in, in this verse, uh, Hades is not a reference to a place burning under the ground where the saints are being tormented, obviously not by demons or devils with pitchforks, but again, Hades is simply a word that describes the grave. And Paul is saying that when even the righteous die, they go to the grave and the wicked also go to the grave, but when Jesus Christ comes on resurrection morning, then his people will come out of the grave shouting victory, praising the Lord, that uh, they will never have to, to worry about the grave again. So, just to summarize, we have two major words in the New Testament that are translated hell in our English Bibles. Gehenna, which is a place of burning, and Hades, which literally means the grave. Now, the word Hades is used in another place that I want to share with you before we wind up part one, and that's in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 is a very, very powerful passage describing the end of the millennium, the end of the 1,000 years, and it describes the resurrection of lost people in verses 12, 13, and 14 who eventually are judged and then who go into the lake of fire. In verse 12, John saw in vision, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is the, what we call the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium, and it is the lost who are being judged. Verse 13 says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And then verse 14 says, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I'm going to hold my Bible up again here so you can see this. If, you, if you've got great eyes, or just take my word for it. Uh, in verse 13, I've got the word hell there, that the lost are coming up out of hell. And I've circled that word, and there's a marginal reference which says the grave. And the Greek word, the original word is Hades, just like in 1 Corinthians 15. So just like the righteous come out of Hades and shout for joy, so at the end of the thousand world, at the end of the thousand years, the lost come out of Hades as well, which means the grave, and then they're judged, and then they go into the lake of fire. Now, let me just uh, summarize these different points here. Notice the order. At the end of the millennium, the lost come out of Hades, they're judged, and they go into the fire. It would certainly be strange if a lost person dies today and goes immediately into the fire, and then at the end of the millennium, he comes out of the fire to get judged. I mean, why would God judge a person 
uh, after he throws them into the fire. That doesn't make sense. And then it would be even stranger if that lost person were to then be sent back into the fire after he's judged. Imagine two people dying. Uh, one person do died a thousand years ago and he was very wicked and he goes into the fire and he's burning and then another wicked person dies today and then he goes down into the fire and he joins that first person. That would mean that the second person uh, burned for a thousand years less and the first person burned for a thousand years longer because they both, um, because they died at different times. And now would that make sense? I mean, the Bible says that God is going to judge people justly and then he's going to punish them. And so it doesn't make sense based on these scriptures that a lost person would go down to, into the fire now and then become, uh, and then get resurrected and then get judged and then go back into the fire. Revelation 20 verse 15 says that at the end of the millennium, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I believe in a real fire. It's coming. But when does that fire come? How long does it burn? Uh, do people go there today? I don't think so. That's not what the Bible says. And what is really the truth about hell? Well, this is the conclusion of part one. Uh, in our next installment, we'll pick up with part two, the hot topic of hell. We'll make it very clear and we'll do it right from the Bible so that when we're done, you will know that you have heard not Steve Wahlberg's opinion, but you have heard his voice today. Don't miss part two. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wahlberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg. The Bible teaches that hell is real, but is it burning now? Are its flames crackling somewhere beneath our feet? Steve Wolberg's pocketbook, The Hot Topic of Hell, separates biblical truth from popular myths. To request your free copy, call us at 1-800-782-4253. You may also write to us at Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 130, Priest River, Idaho, 83856, or online at whitehorsemedia.com.